Section 7 of Diaries, Volume 1, by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 7th March, 1644. I set forward with some company toward Fontainebleau, a sumptuous palace of the kings like ours at Hampton Court, about fourteen leagues from the city. By the way, we passed through a forest so prodigiously encompassed with hideous rocks of whitish hard stone, heaped one on another in mountainous heights, that I think the like is nowhere to be found more horrid and solitary. It abounds with stags, wolves, boars, and not long after a lynx or ounce was killed among them, which had devoured some passengers. On the summit of one of these gloomy precipices, intermingled with trees and shrubs, the stones hanging over and menacing ruin is built an hermitage. In these solitudes rogues frequently lurk and do mischief, and for whom we were all well appointed with our carabines. But we arrived safe in the evening at the village, where we lay at the horn going early next morning to the palace. This house is nothing so stately and uniform as Hampton Court, but Francis I began much to beautify it. Most of all, Henry IV, and not a little, the late king. It abounds with fair halls, chambers and galleries. In the longest, which is 360 feet long and 18 broad, are painted the victories of the great prince, Henry IV. That of Francis I, called the Grand Gallery, has all the king's palaces painted in it. Above these, in sixty pieces of excellent work in fresco, is the history of Ulysses from Homer by Primaticcio, in the time of Henry III, esteemed the most renowned in Europe for the design. The cabinet is full of excellent pictures, especially a woman of Raphael. In the Hall of the Guards is a piece of tapestry painted on the wall, very naturally, representing the victories of Charles VII over our countrymen. In the Salle des Festins is a rare chimney piece, and Henry IV on horseback of white marble, esteemed worth 18,000 crowns. Clementia and Pax, nobly done. On columns of jasper, two lions of brass. The new stairs and half-circular court are of modern and good architecture, as is a chapel built by Louis XIII, all of jasper, with several incrustations of marble through the inside. Having seen the rooms, we went to the Vollery, which has a cupola in the middle of it, great trees and bushes, it being full of birds who drank at two fountains. There is also a fair tennis court and noble stables, but the beauty of all are the gardens. In the court of the fountains stand diverse antiquities and statues, especially a mercury. In the Queen's garden is a Diana ejecting a fountain, with numerous other brass statues. The great garden, 180 toises long and 154 wide, has in the centre a fountain of Tiber of a Colossian figure of brass, with the wolf over Romulus and Remus. At each corner of the garden rises a fountain. In the garden of the Piscina is a Hercules of white marble. Next is that of the Pines, and without that a canal of an English mile in length, at the end of which rise three jettos in the form of a fleur-de-lis of a great height. On the margin are excellent walks planted with trees. The carps come familiarly to hand to be fed. Hence they brought us to a spring, which they say, being first discovered by a dog, gave occasion of beautifying this place, both with the palace and gardens. The white and terrific rocks at some distance in the forest yield one of the most august and stupendous prospects imaginable. The park about this place is very large, and the town full of noblemen's houses. Next morning we are invited by a painter, who is keeper of the pictures and rarities, to see his own collection. We were led through a gallery of old Rosso's work, 
at the end of which, in another cabinet, were three Madonnas of Raphael and two of Andrea del Sarto. In the academy, where the painter himself wrought, was a St. Michael of Raphael, very rare, St. John Baptist of Leonardo and a woman's head, a Queen of Sicily and St. Margaret of Raphael, two more Madonnas, whereof one very large, by the same hand, some more of del Sarto, a St. Jerome of Perino della Varga, the rape of Proserpine, very good, and a great number of drawings. Returning part of our way to Paris that day, we visited a house called Maison Rouge, having an excellent prospect, grot and fountains, one whereof rises fifty feet, and resembles the noise of a tempest, battle of guns, etc., at its issue. Thence to Esson, a house of Monsieur Essling, who is a great virtuoso, there are many good paintings in it, but nothing so observable as his gardens, fountains, fish pools, especially that in a triangular form, the water cast out by a multitude of heads about it. There is a noble cascade and pretty baths, with all accommodations. Under a marble table is a fountain of serpents twisting about a globe. We alighted next at Corbeil, a town famous for the siege by Henry the Fourth. Here we slept, and returned next morning to Paris. 18th March, 1644. I went with Sir J. Cotton, a Cambridge knight, a journey into Normandy. The first day we passed by Gaillon, the Archbishop of Rouen's palace. The gardens are highly commended, but we did not go in, intending to reach Pontoise by dinner. This town is built in a very gallant place, has a noble bridge over the Oise, and is well refreshed with fountains. This is the first town in Normandy, and the furthest that the vineyards extend to on this side of the country, which is fuller of plains, wood, and enclosures, with some towns toward the sea, very like England. Rouen We lay this night at a village called Magny, the next day, descending a very steep hill, we dined at Fleury, after riding five leagues down St. Catherine to Rouen, which affords a goodly prospect to the ruins of that chapel and mountain. This country so abounds with walls that a shepherd whom we met told us one of his companions was strangled by one of them the day before, and that in the midst of his flock. The fields are mostly planted with pears and apples and other cider fruits. It is plentifully furnished with quarries of stone and slate and hath iron in abundance. I lay at the White Cross in Rouen, which is a very large city on the Seine, having two smaller rivers besides called the Aubet and Robec. There stand yet the ruins of a magnificent bridge of stone now supplied by one of boats only, to which come up vessels of considerable burden. The other side of the water consists of meadows, and there have the reformed a church. The cathedral Notre Dame was built, as they acknowledged, by the English. Some English words, graven in Gothic characters upon the front, seem to confirm it. The towers and whole church are full of carving. It has three steeples with a pyramid, in one of these I saw the famous bell, so much talked of, thirteen feet in height, thirty-two round, the diameter eleven, weighing forty thousand pounds. In the chapel d'Amboise, built by a cardinal of that name, lies his body, with several fair monuments. The choir has behind it a great dragon painted on the wall, which they say had done much harm to the inhabitants till vanquished by Saint Romain, their archbishop, for which there is an annual procession. It was now near Easter, and many images were exposed with scenes and stories representing the passion, made up of little puppets, to which there was great resort and devotion with offerings. Before the church is a fair palace, Saint Rouen is another goodly church, and an abbey with fine gardens. Here the king hath lodgings, when he makes his progress through these parts. The structure, where the court of parliament is kept, is very magnificent, 
containing very fair halls and chambers, especially La Chambre Dorée. The town house is also well built, and so are some gentlemen's houses, but most part of the rest are of timber, like our merchants in London, in the wooden part of the city. 21st March 1644. On Easter Monday we dined at Tort, a solitary inn between Rouen and Dieppe, at which latter place we arrived. This town is situated between two mountains, not unpleasantly, and is washed on the north by our English seas. The port is commodious, but the entrance difficult. It has one very ample and fair street, in which is a pretty church. The Fort Polle consists of a strong earthwork and commands the haven, as on the other side does the castle, which is also well fortified, with the citadel before it. Nor is the town itself a little strong. It abounds with workmen who make and sell curiosities of ivory and tortoise shells, and indeed whatever the East Indies afford of cabinets, porcelain, natural and exotic rarities, are here to be had with abundant choice. 23rd March 1644 we passed along the coast by a very rocky and rugged way, which forced us to alight many times before we came to Havre de Grasse, where we lay that night. The next morning we saw the citadel, strong and regular, well stored with artillery and ammunition of all sorts, the works furnished with fair brass cannon, having a motto, Ratio Ultima Regum. The allogement of the garrison are uniform. A spacious place for drawing up the soldiers, a pretty chapel, and a fair house for the governor. The Duke of Richelieu being now in the fort, we went to salute him, who received us very civilly, and commanded that we should be showed whatever we desired to see. The citadel was built by the late Cardinal de Richelieu, uncle of the present Duke, and may be esteemed one of the strongest in France. The haven is very capacious. When we had done here, we embarked ourselves and horses to pass to Enfleur, about four or five leagues distant, where the Seine falls into the sea. It is a poor fisher town, remarkable for nothing so much as the odd yet useful habits which the good women wear, of bears and other skins, as of rugs at Dieppe, and all along these maritime coasts. Come. 25th March 1644. We arrived at Caen, a noble and beautiful town situate on the river Orne, which passes quite through it, the two sides of the town joined only by a bridge of one entire arch. We lay at the Angel, where we were very well used, the place being abundantly furnished with provisions, at a cheap rate. The most considerable object is the great abbey and church, large and rich, built after the Gothic manner, having two spires and middle lantern at the west end, all of stone, the choir round and large, in the centre whereof, elevated on a square handsome but plain sepulchre, is this inscription, Hoc sepulchrum invictissimi juxta et clementissimi conquestoris gulielmi Dum viverat anglorum regis noanorum cenomeno romque principis, who is insignis abatii pisimi fundatoris, cum anno 1562, Vesano hereticorum furore de reptum fuiset, pio tandem nobilium e justem abatii religiosorum gratudinis sensu in tam beneficum largitorem instauratum fuit anne dierne 1642 diano johanne de bel hache asaia tori proto priore d d on the other side are these monkish rhymes qui rexit rigidus northam nos aqui britanos Auductor vicit, vortitur obtinuit, et ceno manensis virtute coetcuit insis, 
in periqui sui legibus applicuit rex magnus parva jacet hac gugliemi in urna sufficit ad magno parva domus domino te septem gradibus te volverat atqui duobus virginis in gremio phoebus et hic obiit we went to the castle which is strong and fair and so is the town house built on the bridge which unites the two towns here are schools and a university for the jurists the whole town is handsomely built of that excellent stone so well known by that name in england i was led to a pretty garden planted with hedges of, of alaternus having at the entrance a screen at an exceeding height accurately cut in topiary work with well understood architecture consisting of pillars niches friezes and other ornaments with great curiosity some of the columns curiously wreathed others spiral all according to art paris 28th march 1644 we went towards paris lying the first night at evreux a bishop's seat an ancient town with a fair cathedral so the next day we arrived at paris first april sixteen forty four i went to see more exactly the rooms of the fine palace of luxembourg in the faubourg st germain built by mary de Domici, and i think one of the most noble entire and finished piles that is to be seen taking it with the garden and all its accomplishments the gallery is the, the painting of Rubens, being the history of the foundress's life, rarely designed. At the end of it is the Duke of Orleans' library, well furnished with excellent books, all bound in Marocain and gilded, the valance of the shelves being of green velvet fringed with gold. In the cabinet joining to it are only the smaller volumes, with six cabinets of medals and an excellent collection of shells and agates, whereof some are prodigiously rich. This duke, being very learned in medals and plants, nothing of that kind escapes him. There are other spacious, noble and princely furnished rooms, which look toward the gardens, which are nothing inferior to the rest. The court below is formed into a square by a corridor, having over the chief entrance a stately cupola covered with stone. The rest is cloistered and arched on pilasters of rustic work. The terrace ascending before the front, paved with white and black marble, is balustered with white marble exquisitely polished. Only the hall below is low and the staircase somewhat of a heavy design but the fascia towards the parterre, which is also arched and vaulted with stone, is of admirable beauty and full of sculpture. The gardens are near an English mile in compass, enclosed with a stately wall and in a good air. The parterre is indeed a box, but so rarely designed and accurately kept cut that the embroidery makes a wonderful effect to the lodgings which front it. It is divided into four squares and as many circular knots, having in the centre a noble basin of marble near thirty feet in diameter, as I remember, in which a triton of brass holds a dolphin that casts a girandola of water near thirty feet high, playing perpetually, the water being conveyed from our coe by an aqueduct of stone, built after the old Roman magnificence. About this ample parterre, the spacious walks and all included, runs a border of freestone adorned with pedestals for pots and statues, and part of it near the steps of the terrace with a rail and baluster of pure white marble. The walks are exactly fair, long and variously descending, and so justly planted with limes, elms and other trees that nothing can be more delicious especially that of the hornbeam hedge, which being high and stately, butts fall on the mountain. Towards the further end is an excavation intended for a vast fish pool, but never finished, and near it is an enclosure for a garden of simples, well kept, and here the duke keeps tortoises in great number, who use the pool of water on one side of the garden. Here is also a conservatory for snow, 
At the upper part, toward the palace, is a grove of tall elms cut into a star, every ray being a walk, whose centre is a large fountain. The rest of the ground is made into several enclosures, all hedgework or rows of trees, of whole fields, meadows, bookages, some of them containing diverse acres. Next to the street side, and more contiguous to the house, are knots in trail or grass work, where likewise runs a fountain. Toward the grotto and stables, within a wall, is a garden of choice flowers, in which the Duke spends many thousand pistoles. In sum, nothing is wanted to render this palace and gardens perfectly beautiful and magnificent, nor is it one of the least diversions to see the number of persons of quality, citizens and strangers, who frequent it, and to whom all access is freely permitted, so that you shall see some walks and retirements full of gallants and ladies, in others melancholy friars, in others studious scholars, in others jolly citizens, some sitting or lying on the grass, others running and jumping, some playing at bowls and ball, others dancing and singing, and all this without the least disturbance, by reason of the largeness of the place. What is most admirable, you see no gardeners or men at work, and yet all is kept in such exquisite order, as if they did nothing else but work. It is so early in the morning that all is dispatched and done, without the least confusion. I have been the larger in the description of this paradise for the extraordinary delight I have taken in those sweet retirements. The cabinet and chapel nearer the garden front have some choice pictures. All the houses near this are also very noble palaces, especially Petit Luxembourg. The ascent of the street is handsome from its breadth, situation and buildings. I went next to view Paris from the top of Saint-Jacques steeple, esteemed the highest in the town, from whence I had a full view of the whole city and suburbs, both which, as I judge, are not so large as London, though the dissimilitude of their several forms and situations, this being round London long, renders it difficult to determine. But there is no comparison between the buildings, palaces and materials, this being entirely of stone and more sumptuous, though I esteem our piazzas to exceed theirs. Hence I took a turn in St Innocent's churchyard, where the story of the devouring quality of the ground, consuming bodies in twenty-four hours, the vast charnels of bones, tombs, pyramids and sepulchres, took up much of my time, together with the hieroglyphical characters of Nicholas Flamel's philosophical work, who had founded this church, and divers other charitable establishments, as he testifies in his book. Here divers clerks get their livelihood by inditing letters for poor maids and other ignorant people who come to them for advice, and to write for them into the country, both to their sweethearts, parents and friends every large gravestone serving for a table. Joining to this church is a common fountain, with good relievos upon it. The next day I was carried to see a French gentleman's curious collection, which abounded in fair and rich jewels of all sorts of precious stones, most of them of great sizes and value, agates and onyxes, some of them admirably coloured and antique nor inferior were his landscapes from the best hands, most of which he had caused to be copied in miniature, one of which, rarely painted on stone, was broken by one of our company by the mischance of setting it up, but such was the temper and civility of the gentleman that it altered nothing of his free and noble humour. The next morning I was had by a friend to the garden of Monsieur Morin, who from being an ordinary gardener, is become one of the most skilful and curious persons in France for his rare collection of shells, flowers and insects. His garden is of an exact oval figure, planted with cypress, cut flat and set as even as a wall. The tulips, anemones, ranunculuses, crocuses, etc. are held to be of the rarest and draw all the admirers of that kind to his house during the season. 
he lived in a kind of hermitage at one side of his garden, where his collection of porcelain and graal, whereof one is carved into a large crucifix, is much esteemed. He has also books of prints by Albert Dürer, van Leyden, Callow, etc. His collection of all sorts of insects, especially of butterflies, is most curious. These he spreads, and so medicates, that no corruption invading them, he keeps them in drawers, so placed as to represent a beautiful piece of tapestry. He showed me the remarks he had made on their propagation, which he promised to publish. Some of these, as also of his best flowers, he had caused to be painted in miniature by rare hands, and some in oil. 6th April 1644 I sent my sister my own picture in watercolours, which she requested of me and went to see divers of the fairest palaces of the town, as that of Vendôme, very large and stately, Lugerville, Guise, Condé, Chevreuse, Nevers, esteemed one of the best in Paris, toward the river. I often went to the Palais Cardinal, bequeathed by Richelieu to the king, on condition that it should be called by his name. At this time the king resided in it because of the building of the Louvre, it is a very noble house, though somewhat low. The galleries, paintings of the most illustrious persons of both sexes, the Queen's baths, presence chamber, with its rich carved and gilded roof, theatre and large garden, in which is an ample fountain, grove and mall, worthy of remark. Here I also frequently went to see them ride and exercise the great horse, especially at the Academy of Monsieur du Plessis and de Vaux, whose schools of that art are frequented by the nobility. And here also young gentlemen are taught to fence, dance, play on music, and something in fortification and the mathematics. The design is admirable, some keeping near a hundred brave horses, all managed to the great saddle. 12th April 1644 I took coach to see a general muster of all the gendarmes about the city in the Bois de Boulogne before their majesties and all the grandees. There were reputed to be near 20,000 besides the spectators who much exceeded them in number. Here they performed all their motions and being drawn up horse and foot into several figures represented a battle. End of section 7